morning, everyone. Morning, family of the living God. Thank you so much for the invitation to the elders. And again, it's a privilege and honor for me to stand up front this morning to be bringing to you one more message of the Word of God. The title of my lesson for this morning is the following. The name of the lesson is the true church. The church in Philadelphia. Thanks, Brother Jerry, for the scripture reading. Uh, we find the church in Philadelphia in the chapter 3. Beginning with the verse 1, I just choose verse 7, verse 8, and verse 11 to bring you a, my, my a lesson for you this morning. The true church, the church in Philadelphia. When I was prepping this lesson, I was searching in Google about the history of Philadelphia, and Google showed me the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. And I thought, I, I, I'm not going to be teaching about this Philadelphia. I'm going to be teaching about the Philadelphia that the Apostle Young is mentioned, uh, mentioning in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. Philadelphia, it was the youngest of the seven cities. Remember that the book of Revelation is talking about the seven churches in Asia Minor. And Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities. And the name Philadelphia means brotherly love. That's what really the name means, brotherly love. And also, it's a combination of two Greek words. Phileo, that means love in English. And the other one is Adolphos, that means brother. So we, the combination of these two words is the meaning of the name brotherly love. But originally refer, this name originally refer to incest in honor to his founder, Philadelphus. His nickname of the, of the founder of this city was Philadelphus. And Philadelphus, that's what really means. Means a relationship of incest. This founder of this city get married with his own sister. So that's the origin of this name, Philadelphia. And like I said before, it was the youngest city. It was like a, like a bridge or like a road of communication to spread the uh, language, the Greek language, and also the culture of the of the country of Greece at this time. So that was a very important city. This, this city was also similar to Athens. It was also called the Little Athens. It was a beautiful city like Athens with many beautiful buildings. That's the story that I can share with you about this city or like an introduction at the lesson that we will have <clears throat> having this morning. In the, in the verse 7, we find Jesus describing himself. Jesus is introducing himself to the church. And Jesus starts saying to the church and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one uh, will chat, and who chats and no one open says this. Jesus introduced himself to the church at the same way that he did it with the other six churches, the same messages. But if you see right here, you notice right here, the message is, first of all, 
to the angel. The word angel in the Greek means messenger. Or the angel that was sending by God for the Father was bringing all of them, was, they were bringing a message from God. So that's the meaning of the word angel. But right here, the word angel is talking about the preacher or the minister. In other words, the message that Jesus is giving to the Apostle John is going to be direct or lead to the, to the preacher or the congregation in Philadelphia. In other words, Jesus is saying to the preacher, remember, remember preacher or remember minister, I am the owner of the church. You are not the owner of the church. You are only a messenger of the church. In other words, you are only my steward in this local congregation, in this city. But I am the owner of the church. Let's keep in mind this one, that the owner of the church is not the preacher. It's not the angel. It's not the messenger. The owner of the church are not the elders. The owner of the church are not the deacons. Let's keep in mind this one. The owner of the church is Jesus Christ. Say it to the angel, say it to the messenger. A young holy, Jesus is saying, describing himself. He who is holy. And he is mentioned to the church or to the preacher. He's attributes or some of his attributes and we find some attributes of jesus right here in his uh, uh, when he's describing to the church he's saying to the church unholy number one unholy untrue and i have the key of david in other words i have authority or i have power attributes that belong to god in other words jesus is describing himself as the father as god holy holy jesus does not describe this word does not not only describe tendency within jesus but his very being his very being this shows that Jesus is equal Yahweh or equal Jehovah or the Father. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, we read that the Father, Yahweh, is holy. And Jesus is saying right here, I'm holy. He's describing himself equal to the Father, because the Father, He alone is holy in absolute sense. Saying is Jesus. He's holy in absolute sense. The one who is holy is giving this message to you, the angel or preacher or church. And then Jesus said, Another attribute that he is mentioned right here, a uh, true. In the in the Greek, in the language, in the Greek language, we find two words that mean almost the same meaning. Almost, but it's not the same. There are two words to describe the word true. Uh, the first, the first one uh, means true and not false. And the so the second one word in the Greek also mean true and not fake the second one that jesus is using right here to describe himself is the second one true and no fake in other words jesus is true and no fake 
this mean that Jesus is real? He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a real. He was a real God. He's a real God. Jesus is genuine. That's the meaning of this word, aletinos, or the word true. Jesus is aletinos. Jesus is real. Jesus is genuine. In other words, Jesus is true in all of who he is. He is the real God and the real man. Some people say, oh, Jesus was man, but not God, not completely God, because he left his position on heaven and took the form of a human being. No, that's not true. Jesus was a real man and a real God. In other words, 100% God and 100% man. So that's the word that uh, uh, the Lord Jesus is using to describe himself. And true, and the true one. Who is the true one? The Father. The Father is true one. But Jesus is describing himself as the Father, equal to the Father. And he's introducing to the church. I'm saying this thing because I am the owner of the church. I am the Holy One. I am the true one, the genuine, the real God. And he also has something else. I am the one that have the key of David. The key of David. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20 and verse 23 is talking about this one that Jesus is mentioned right here. David had the key or the kingdom of Israel. This expression means that David got the authority to give his kingdom whatever or whoever he pleased. And Jesus is saying, I had the key of David. In other words, I got the power, I got the authority to open doors and shut doors, and the doors that I Shut, no one can opens, and the doors that opens, no one is able to shut. What happened in Noah's day? What happened in, 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 in Noah's flood? There was an ark, and the people needs to get in to be saved. But in the last minute or in the last moment, the Lord God shuts the door. And the question is, it was someone able to open the door? I imagine that many people were knocking the door. Noah, Noah, please open the door. Open the door. Noah himself wasn't able to open the door. Because the door that the Lord God shuts, no one is able to open it. And the one that he opens, no one is able to shut it. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. I have the keep of David. In other words, Jesus showed he's also the keeper of the keys and doors. He's the keepers. In the chapter one of Revelation, Jesus said to John, I have the key of death and the key of Hades. He has the keys. Listen, the key of death, in other words, he has control in life and death. The key of Hades, the place of the dead. I have the key of the dead. And now in the chapter 3, he's saying to, uh, to John, give this message to the church in Philadelphia and tell them that I have the key of David. I also have the key of David. In other words, I can give salvation whoever I want. I remember that Sister Carmel was asking in Brother Derek class, Jesus 
saves people before his resurrection and he having commanded yet yeah, the baptism. And the baptism is for salvation and for forgiveness of sin. All right. Jesus got, had the key of David. He got the authority, the power to say whoever he wants. He's God. But don't misunderstand my words. I'm not saying that he is using favoritism for certain peoples and, and not for others. I'm not saying that. It's according to his word. Is according the war of God. But he got the power to open doors and close doors. That's the meaning right here of the keep of David. He got the keep of David. In other words, Jesus expressed his power, authority, especially to admit and exclude. He got that. Jesus know that this church was a true church. How Jesus know or how Jesus knew this? Jesus is saying to the church, I know your words. I know your words. See, I have said before you an open door. And no one can chat it, for you have a little strength. I've kept my word and have not denied my name. How, what Jesus knows about, this, about the church in Philadelphia? Jesus knew that it was a true church. Jesus knew that was a true church because Jesus knew about four things about this church. Works. This church was a church that was working. Working, not in, 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 in material things, working in the spiritual things. He knew that. It was a church that was working, working very hard, even in time. Of persecutions, they didn't deny their faith. They were continue working hard, and Jesus, Jesus is proud. Of them. he's saying, "I know your works." Jesus knows everything about us. He's the same, the same thing with us right here. The East Full Hill Church of Christ. We are the true church of Jesus. Remember. He knew, he knew all works. He knew if we are working or, are, or we are not working. He knew all works. He's also saying about this church, I have set an upper, open door before you. Jesus knew that this church was an open door. The word open doors simply means evangelistic opportunities. That's the meaning of the word or the expression open or the church in Philadelphia, they were an open door for all the unbelievers in the city. In other words, they were saying, welcome to Jesus. Welcome. But not only expressing words. The first one, work. They were working, working very hard, very hard for Jesus. In other words, preaching the gospel, preaching the good news, preaching and talking about the crucified one, preaching about the one who died on a cross and, and rose from the dead and the one that was alive. They were teaching about that the one that was the real God, the one that was holy, the one that got power, the one that got authority. They were teaching and preaching and spreading the good news, 
That's the idea of open door. And Jesus said to them, how, is, how am I saying that this chore was a true chore? If Jesus is, is saying, but you have a little strength. You can say, a true chore is a chore that has to be very strong. Right? No. Little strength. There are contradiction right here. Working hard, open door, but have a little strength. So, Brother Carlos, how, how were you teaching this morning that this was a true charge? It was a little strength. Okay, we're going to explain pretty soon about that. And Jesus also said, a true charge. Is a shore that keep the word of God. That respect and keep the word of God. We hear about many churches around. Around here, the city, in the whole state of California, in the whole country, in the whole world. Many churches proclaiming that, that they are true churches. But a true church is the church that keep the word of God. If we are not keeping the word of God, we are not a true church. And this church, they were keeping the word of God, the word of Jesus. You see, Jesus is not saying nothing negative about this church. But if you read the other chapters about the other churches in Asia, you're gonna, you're not gonna read the same. But this short was different. Okay, we're saying that open door means evangelistic opportunities. One day, one man asked to the minister, Minister, how can, how could I? Uh, Conquer, or how could I uh, uh, win people to Jesus? And the minister uh, asking, What do you do? Or what are you? And the man uh, says to the minister, I am an engine uh, driver on a, a I am an engine a driver in, on a train. And the minister responds to him. Is the man who shovel a, a coal in your train a Christian? And the man responds to the minister or to the preacher. I don't know. Then the preacher or the minister said to him, you don't know? And the man responds to him again, no, I don't know. Go back, the, the preacher said to the man, go back, find out, and start on him. It's easy. It's simple. Sometimes God sets open doors or evangelistic opportunities before us. But we don't see it. That's the problem. We don't see it. This man, he, he, he haven't seen it. The opportunity was very close, very close to him. It is the same for us. Sometimes we are thinking, oh, uh, we need to go to preach the gospel, but we need to go far away. Far away. Let's go far away. We don't need to go far away. Let's ask the same question. Are all the members of our of, of family Christians? If they are not, let's start from them. Are our neighbors, all of them Christians? If not, let's start from them. The, op the doors are open over there. This church. They were 
preaching the gospel in the whole city and going beyond. At the same way that they were spreading uh, the language and the culture of Greece, they were also at the same time spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the same way, it's the same thing that we must do or, or we can do is to heal Church of Christ. We don't need to go far away. Jesus Christ has set an open door before us. The same way that he set an open door in Philadelphia. Evangelistic opportunities for us. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse uh, 9, the apostle uh, Paul uh, said to the, to the church in Ephesus, in, Cor in, in, in Corinth, I'm sorry, I remain in Ephesus. Why? Why the apostle Paul wanted to remain in Ephesus? And he's saying in the verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, in Ephesus, because in Ephesus, a wide door was open. That was the reason that the apostle Paul, he wanted to remain in Ephesus. Because a wide door was open. Who opened that wide door? Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, a great evangelistic opportunity I have right here in Ephesus. I'm not going to move. I don't need to go to Rome. I don't need to come back to Corinth. Right here. Right here. It's Full Hill Church of Christ. Right here in the neighborhood. We got an open door. Jesus is opening a, a door for us right here. We only need to start walking through that door in faith. And that's it. That's all that we need. They were doing that. Philadelphia were doing that. That's the reason that was a true church. And then the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, in, in trust, a wide door was open. Now Paul is talking about another city. He traveled to another city, and when he was in that city, he started seeing the opportunities, the evangelistic opportunities. Every time when we are, we are chopping, there are evangelistic opportunities over there. A lot of people. Are all those people Christians? Have you asked yourself, are all those people Christians? Most of them, no. Then the Apostle Paul said to the, uh, to the Colossians, praying for us as well. We need, Paul is saying, I need your prayers, brothers and sisters. I need your prayers that God pray for me and for the other a, a man, for the other minister, for the other preacher, that God will open up to us a door for the world. The one that opened the door is Jesus Christ. He opened a door in Philadelphia. But they decide to keep that door open. The church in Philadelphia was a true church because they, they keep working. They were an open door for the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we were saying, how is this a true church if they have a little strength? The term, a little strength, does not imply weakness, but real strength. Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia, have the poverty of spirit. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? He said, Blessed are poor of spirit, because of there is the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. This is good. It's not a matter of great strength. Not great ability, but great dependence. That's the matter. 
And the good example or the great example of this is the Apostle Paul. What the Apostle Paul said? When I am weak, I'm strong. And when I'm thinking that I'm strong, I'm faithful. And that's right. When we are thinking that, oh, I'm so faithful. I'm so faithful to God. Be careful. Be careful. You are saying that you, you don't depend on God. You don't depend on Jesus. We must be saying, no, I'm weak. But I'm strong in the Lord. That, that's what, exactly what happened with the church in Philadelphia. Have a little strength. They were working hard, brothers and sisters. They were an open door, but they also were thinking, oh, this is not enough. We have a, a little strength. We need more. What about Samson? You remember Samson? Physically strong. He was trusting, Samson was, was trusting in his strength, in his ability, but he, he was not trusting too much in the Lord. Until the last day of his life. He came back to the Lord. Lord, tell me. And then the strength came back, not for his hair, but because of God. So that's the explanation of this expression right here. Have a little strength. This is good. When we are saying I'm I'm very uh, poor in spirit, that's mean I need of God every day. That's the reason that we are gathered together this morning, because we have a little strength. And we, we need to get more strength. And the only way is gathering together and worshiping God and praising the Lord and asking uh, to the Lord for that, for it. And another, another features or characteristic that says that this chore was a true chore is because they kept the word of Jesus Christ. And they, they didn't deny his name. The church in Philadelphia was faithful. But faithful to Jesus and his word. There are two different things. People, you're going to hear people outside saying, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I don't need to, uh, I don't need to congregate. I don't need to assemble. Oh, I don't need to believe all the Bible. Just Jesus. But not necessarily the Bible, but Jesus. No religion, but Jesus. But the church, the church in Philadelphia, it wasn't thinking that way. They said, we keep the war. We are faithful to the war, but we also, we are faithful to Jesus Christ, the giver of the war. If we are faithful to Jesus, we're going to be also faithful to his war. Both are together. Jesus and his war. And that's the reason that I'm teaching this morning that this was a true church. What Jesus wants the church of Philadelphia to do? Continue. Continue that. They are in the right track. Continue that. Hold fast what you have. Jesus is not saying, oh, I have something to say about you. No, no, no. All fast what you have. All fast what you have. What did they have? Number one, evangelistic opportunity. They were an open door. Continue in that. You are doing good. Number two, right alliance on God. You have a little strength. Continue in that. And number three, 
faithfulness to Jesus. In other words, continue keeping my word. Don't deny my name. Continue that. Nothing negative to say about the church. It's encouraging the church. All past what you have. That's a beautiful words that Jesus is saying about this to church. This is the typical example for us, this church. Let's follow this example of this church, Philadelphia Church. This was a local church of Christ in the city of Philadelphia that was pleasing to his Lord or to his honor. And in verse 11, he said, why is necessary keeping this, what you're doing? Why? Because Jesus is saying, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly or fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. You are doing excellent. Don't trust yourself saying, oh, we are ready to get heaven. No, not yet. Or fast what you have. Because you don't continue uh, holding fast what you have, someone else can pay your reward. Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. The expression, come quickly, not necessarily means immediately, but in the Greek, this, this word in the Greek means sudden, unexpected. Like Jesus said in the gospel, like a thief. And coming back like a thief. Because somebody can say, come quickly, and you have a car there. He said this one almost more than 2,000 years ago. And Jesus was saying to the church in Philadelphia, I'm coming quickly. Expression only means sorry. Wait, but suddenly. Suddenly, Jesus can come right now. And come later, tonight, tomorrow morning, after tomorrow, next year, I don't know. But he's coming quickly. He's coming. You are not a member of the church of Christ, or the true church of the Lord. This is the opportunity that we have to come to Jesus' feet, repenting of our sins, confessing his holy name. Remember, he's the true one. He's the real one. He's the holy one. And he's the one that he is able to save you this morning. And always, you only need to confess his name, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. The lesson is yours. God bless everyone.